Ms. Sarah Karloff. Some of you may recognize the last name because it's associated with uh, Boris Karloff, who happens to be one of the greatest horror film actors of ever of all time. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, you know growing up with Boris Karloff. <laughs> it must have been amazing. Well, he was amazing. He truly was. He was a, the antithesis of the roles he played. He couldn't have been um, kinder, gentler, funnier man. And he was a lovely human being. That's something that I've read about, that everybody says that he was the most gentle soul off camera, and then he played these horrific creatures on film. And it's, it's something that I see a lot in actors, with, especially actors who do a lot of heavy roles, like you know villains and, and monsters and so forth. Off camera, they're gentle and sweet and kind, and it's so amazing how they transform themselves. Well, he was a good actor. Yes, yes. <laughs> Jack Pierce was the makeup genius that developed the makeup for Frankenstein and most of the, the uh, classic horror roles that my father played, um, Jack Pierce did. And um, uh, my father regarded him as an absolute genius and said he owed him so much. Uh -huh. And um, the combination of, as far as Frankenstein was concerned, the combination of uh, James Whale's direction and Jack Pierce's makeup and the basic story of Mary Shelley mm -hmm. and then the, the empathetic portrayal that my father gave to the role. That was a perfect marriage of, of talents and, and interpretations. It, it created this cinematic um, magic. Yes, which is, you know, it's will go down as an all-time classic, you know, I mean, especially, the, yeah. It's, 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 it's thanks to the talents of those individuals, and it's also thanks to the film base, fan base. The, the fans have, have been marvelous throughout the years, and they continue to be. The films um, are multi-generational in their appeal. Um, it's amazing to me all the youngsters who uh, are, are crazy about these films, who know the dialogue. What do you, what do you think it is about the, about the, is it the portrayal, is it the performance, is it the combination of things that is able to transcend the generations? I think it's a lot of those things. I think one of the things my father said about the films, he preferred the word terror to the word, word horror. Mm -hmm. And he said, these films in, in, did not insult the intelligence of the audience. They invited the participation uh, and, uh, of the audience's intelligence and their imagination, mm -hmm. and they didn't dump the gore into the lap of the audience. Right, right. They, they used black and white film and the shadowing that black and white film uses and the suspense that black and white film adds to a, to a film. And all of this combination of elements really um, involved the audience far more than today's films does. That's and a fair point. I like that. Uh, like and I ask when, I when I'm invited to speak to classes, um, I ask what the youngsters feel about colorizing these films. And, and to, to a student, they feel absolutely not. So this generation gets it. They understand the value of black and white film. They understand the value of the suspense and the storyline and leaving a lot up to the audience. Yeah, it's, all, it's mostly in the imagination, right? As it is indeed. Being, You'd know. much rather wonder what's around the corner than to have it dumped in your lap. And uh, I think that that's why these films have these long legs of, uh, and these long years and years and years of longevity in this huge following amongst their fans. Yep. You know, it was my father's 81st film and no one had seen the first 80, so. <laughs> <laughs> been around 20 years and nobody knew it except yeah. him. But he was an overnight star after 20 years, yeah. you know. And but, it could be worse, right? Oh, yeah, right. He could still be an unknown star. Now, is there a film of his that maybe audiences don't know well that you find particularly outstanding that, that you think people should check out? Targets. Mm. That's probably that's his last film of, of any real merit, mm -hmm. and he did it with Peter Bogdanovich, and it was a, um, a film about a sniper, mm -hmm. and it Peter Bogdanovich wrote it, directed it, and acted in it, alongside my father, and uh, my father really enjoyed working with Peter, 
and he really admired Peter's creativity and talent. And in it, my father has a monologue, um, and uh, which he did in one take. And the whole cast and crew stood up and applauded him at the end of that. And that, that brought tears to my father's eyes, because at that point in his career, to have that sort of an accolade from his peer group meant so much to him. But it's a fine film, and the mess, it, it's, about a, it's about a sniper. Mm -hmm. And it came out originally at the time of the Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King assassinations. And unfortunately, it was pulled prematurely, of course, because of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it was shelved for quite a number of years. But it's now available on DVD. Nice. And the message of the film really is that the real horror, and it was my father's philosophy too, that the real horror is on the streets and not up on the uh, not up on the screen, mm -hmm. and how appropriate for today and the horrors that are going on in the theaters, in the classroom, on the streets, and um, it's a fine film, and I would really recommend anybody go and see it. And then, of course, he won a Grammy for How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Exactly, yes. Yes, he, he did, is the voice in that. A lot. It's incredible. The Grinch and narrated it, so he was, he, he loved his profession, and he um, he also was a founding member. This is something he was the most, I think, the most proud of. He was a founding member of the Screen Actors Guild. And I did not know that. And his card number was number nine. I just want to say, as a member of the Screen Actors Guild, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate your father very much. You know, I don't, I don't. My number is a little bit further than nine. <laughs> well, actually, a lot further than nine. But I, I, I want to ask you the same question, actually, that I asked uh, Chris Costello earlier. At what age did you become aware of who your father was and how important he was to uh, American cinema and horror? You don't really. Mm -hmm. You don't really. It was fun riding in an elevator with him and watching people try to b mind their manners. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So bit, but you don't really, you know. But did you notice people's behavior a certain way towards Sure, you? in like, an elevator. This, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is my father, and they're, they yeah. want to maybe... You know, well, just think of him as dad, and yet... You know, he didn't. He was very modest, very self-effacing. He, he didn't. He what, didn't collect memorabilia. God knows, I wish he'd collected movie posters. But um, he didn't talk about himself. He didn't bring his work home. He didn't talk about his career. He didn't talk about other actors. You know, his friends. A lot of them weren't even in the industry. A lot of them weren't. Uh, uh, were as many in f behind the cameras as it were in front of the cameras. So he, uh, it just, he just wasn't what you would expect. Is there, is there a website or anything? I have a website. Yeah. It's, okay, uh, my website is www.karloff.com. I kept it simple so I'd remember it. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. And I have an um, email address, which is karloff at karloff.com. They kept that simple so I'd remember it. <laughs> well, it's been a treasure and a treat speaking with you. It's so good to, to meet you. And if only I had, had the opportunity to meet your dad. He's, I'm sure he's, you know, you've heard that many times. Well, you know, this has nothing to do with me. I'm nothing more than a conduit for people that wish they'd had an opportunity to meet my father. And the minute, the minute I lose sight of that, I better stay home and clean my oven. <laughs> <laughs>